Okay. We had a hiccup. <laughs> What's new? <laughs> it is Wednesday, February 14th. We're picking up on our Bereshit Genesis Bible study in chapter 35. Uh, we'll start at verse 4, but we'll review 1 through 4. But in honor of it being Valentine's Day, I just wanted to share a story with you. It's a true story. It's of the past. I don't know how far past, and I don't know what mission filled. But it was a family that was on the mission field back in the day when you didn't have the cell phones and you didn't have the connection. The missionaries were really out there more in the rural areas. And it was an area where medically it, things were far more primitive and harder to get to, so forth, so on. And uh, the missionary couple had two children, an older daughter and a younger son. And the daughter had been involved in an accident and it wasn't life-threatening, but it was extremely serious, and she needed a blood transfusion. Getting her to the main hospital was not possible in time for what her needs were. But the family knew that the two children shared the same blood type. So the little guy was only about six years old, and they explained to him that his sister needed his blood. And, you know, asked him if he would be willing to, to share with her so that she could, you know, continue to live. They were trying to say it in a way that wouldn't scare him, but, you know, the seriousness of the situation, they wanted him to be a, a partner with it. And they saw his little bottle lip go out and start trembling, and he looked, you know, pretty, pretty afraid and hit the heaviness of it all, and, and he finally, or just moments, you know, later, agreed that, yes, he would give his sister his blood. And so they set it up, and they started the transfusion, and this was body to body instead of, you know, taking a bag. And then, you know, so he's right there as it's starting. And he looked up at the, the doctor that was, you know, doing the procedure. And he asked, he said, so when do I start to die? And they looked at him, you know, die? You're not going to die. And they realized he thought that he had been asked to give his blood for his sister so that she might live. And he thought that meant that he'd give his life for his sister. Oh, boy. <laughs> and what love that that little six-year-old said yes, didn't throw a fit, and laid down his life for his sister. Thankfully, they could reassure that little guy in a heartbeat. <laughs> you won't die. We weren't choosing her over you. <laughs> you both will go on and live long, healthy lives by the Lord's grace. But what a beautiful um, uh, example of what the Lord did do, because it did cost him his life. So, just had to share. Now I have to get the tears out of my eyes <laughs> so I can see my Bible. <laughs> and we can go on, but it just mm. came to my mind this morning, and I thought, you know, how precious and how sweet. The heart of love. The heart of our God. And again, if you don't feel love today, then look up, because your Valentine is there looking down and saying, I love you. I love you. I chose you. I died for you. I'm living for you. Come live in my power and live with me one day. Hallelujah. Maybe even today. Okay, if not, or even if so, wouldn't it be a blast to go from reading the word to seeing the word? <laughs> <laughs> Bame me up, Lord. <laughs> Chapter 35, we saw that, Ye that Jehovah, God, said to, to Yaakov, to Jacob, to rise, go to Bethel, Bethel, live there, make an altar to God, who appeared when you fled from your brother Esau. Took us back to the time years prior before he went, uh, before he had gone to put on our arm, he's on his way out. He knew three days out the dream that he was given of the ladder of Jehovah, telling him that he would be with him, he would take him out, he would bring him back. This is what happened at Beit El, at the house of God. He built an altar for him there. Then he went, spent 20 years in Padan Aram. It's on, it has come back into the land, but it hasn't come back into Beit El yet. He's, he's in Shechem, remember? He uh, probably settled there out of either a, a tiredness or 
thinking that I've done, I'm back to the land, but not really doing, not, not, maybe he didn't even really realize, but God wanted him to come to faith out, to Bethel, to the house of God, come all the way back, come to the altar where I appeared to you. So with the circumstances of Shechem happening, uh, where the, um, his daughter Dina was violated, the brothers Simeon, Shimon, and Levi, Levi uh, took it into their hands, they they um, threw a did. ploy. Yes. Two of them did. Yes, Simeon oh. and Levi. They made a ploy that took the lives of all the the men in Shechem. Uh, Jacob hears about it because they came back home with all the booty, all the other brothers ga gathering in on the booty, bringing the booty back, the women, the children, back to where they were. He's saying, "What did you do?" Now they're going to want to kill me. He doesn't even seem to, to resonate with him that, that they did something for Dinah's sake, for her name's sake, that Jacob hadn't addressed. He's just more worried about himself. It's probably what it took to prod this man, though, get up and get going, because he doesn't feel safe now. He feels like he needs to get to where he needs to, um, to be where he'll be surrounded by God in his presence and feel that safety that comes in that. So he's ready to, to start them. But at the same time, I think that he's really beginning to realize the spiritual depth, the change that's taking place in him as he's learning to go from the name Yaakov to the name Israel. And we'll talk about that as we go on also. But he's beginning to see the spiritual role that he needs to be fulfilling. And so he tells them, the whole family, you know, come, we're going to move, we're going to go to Baal, we're going to go to the house of God, but those idols that you have, we can't go with those. Your garments are filthy, you need to, to wash. The, the getting rid of the idols would have been the idols that Rachel brought that she took from her father's house. We went into reasons why before, so I won't now, but I don't think it was at all for her to worship them. That, that's I'll just say X that one out and go look for my other reasons in the videos that, that I earlier brought out. It would have been the idols that came with the people that they just brought in, the women and the children. It would have been the idols of their servants that had come into Jacob's uh, realm because of his prosperity. All of those. They needed to get rid of every bit of them. There is no God but the one true and living God. And he said, thou shalt not make any graven image of him. And anything in our lives that, that you can see tangibly that's an idol, get rid of it. Get, get it out of the house, but realize there are ways to have idols that are in our minds and our thoughts, not just 3D. Yes, Loretta? Why did in verse 4, why did they get all their earrings and Jacob hid them? Okay, because that's also the earrings were charms that had to do with the worship, it had it represented the gods. They weren't just an earring that was something cute or pretty like women will wear today. That the men and the women wore these earrings and used them in their false, idolatrous, worshipful ways. So we dealt with that also earlier um, in a little more detail, but that's it in a nutshell. So all of that, they needed to get rid of everything that had any connection. And I will encourage you, if you've been in a religion that has any kind of leftover anything you can feel touch see why hide them i don't the I hiding we'll talk about in a moment i don't okay. think we've gotten there yet the fourth verse yeah yeah we have not that's where we're picking up today so we'll talk about the hiding but he's telling them bring them all to him he's going to to get rid of them all and to purify themselves that's a a picture on the outside of what's taking place on the inside that to cleanse them outwardly which show that they're looking to be clean, even as the washings for the priests and for the people will be given in the law, even as we look at baptism today, the, the going down in the water in the filth and then coming up clean. In that way also, um, our garments in scripture, the, our, when we have the garment, the robe of righteousness, we put on a clean new garment. Uh, many of this, we talked about it last week, I think we even looked at the verses last week, Jude only has one chapter, verse 23, talks about the, the to separate from the garment that's gotten filthy from what we are doing, Ephesians 4, 22 to 24 speaks about it, so again, if uh, you want more detail, go back to the last lesson, because we talked a little more in detail, but there's an inward cleansing, because they are turning to 
the one true and living God and he only and wanting to walk in his ways follow him in obedience and it's to show on the inside what's going on on the outside and he's telling them that they have to do this remove the foreign gods purify yourselves change your garments verse 3 let's arise and go up to Beit El to the house of God I'll make an altar there to God who answered me on the day of my distress distress and has been with me wherever I've gone he's acknowledging God did exactly what he said at Beit El he was with him all the way to Panoram, all the way back, even in Shechem, and even now as he's heading back, God is with him, and he wants to honor him, make an altar unto him also. And now here's your question. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which they had, and the rings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the oak which was near Shechem. Okay, maybe I didn't bring out the earrings last time. Again, the, let me make it clear that they were symbols of certain gods that were worshipped, or they were charms used against um, evil, you know, was their way of, of doing it. Let me show you the scriptures because maybe we didn't do it last week. Hosea 2 and verse 13. Hosea, Hosea chapter 2 and verse 13. We read there, I will punish her for the days of the Baals. Baal was the name, false name of the head god of many gods under Baal. When she used to offer sacrifices to them and adorn herself with her earrings and jewelry and follow her lover so that she forgot me, declares the Lord. So in this, the adorning with the earrings and the jewelry was in honor of Baal. You know, even as we'll choose jewelry today to honor our God, we'll wear a cross speaking of the Lord and, and his salvation brought to us through the cross. Uh, so even in that way, it's Hosea chapter 2 and verse 13, if that's what you're asking. If it's, Hosea, right? Yes, Hosea. Okay. okay, and then I'm going to take you to Exodus, and then if you still have a question, Maria, I will take you at that point. Exodus chapter 33 verses 2 to 4. This is when they come out of Egypt. Shmot, Exodus 33, verse 2. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canite, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Get up to a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst, because you're an obstinate people. I've got the wrong scripture. <laughs> It was 32. 32. 32. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Like... I'm waiting for it to come. I'm thinking, I don't remember reading this today in study. Okay, sorry. In chapter 32, verse 2, Aharon, Aaron said to them, Tear off the gold rings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters. Notice they all wore them. Bring them to me. Then all the people tore off the gold rings which were in their ears, brought them to Haron. He took, them from, he took this from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool, made it into a molten calf, and said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. I used to think that, that you know, they just formed this calf and then said that did it. But when I studied this in depth, I realized they took the charms and the symbols representing the gods made that into that calf and that's why they were saying this calf is is that god you know that these were symbols of they just made one great big symbol of him and he's who brought him up out of egypt really and and brought them through the the red sea and drowned the egyptian army i don't know how god didn't just zap them you know it took being god it took being merciful above what is deserved a uh, grace beyond measure to not just wipe them out at that point for giving <laughs> credit to to a false god for what mercifully our god did for them wow but that shows you how the earrings were part of it so they need to get rid of all of that no nothing left that is would cling on to a false belief in a false god when you just uh, burn them instead of bury them We'll talk about it. I'll we'll give you an idea. Okay. Maria, do you still have a question? No. Okay. <laughs> it should look like maybe she didn't. I thought you had your hand up, but maybe you didn't. Okay. So sorry. Okay. So back in Genesis 35, we read and that Jacob hid them. Okay. And, and I keep being asked, why hide them? Why not burn them? Mm-hmm. 
what we get from this, number one, the, the most important is this was not converting them to, oh, well, it was bad, let me make it into something better. They didn't do that. It was not to be used in any way in the service of God, and it wasn't to be a part of them in any manner. If they were gold and, and so forth, burning them would only melt them down. They could be turned into another form. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Burying them, I think, was the best uh, thing that Jacob could come up with to get rid of them forever. You know, Jacob. Put a, yes, Jacob's the one leading it. Oh, yeah. But He's someone else to them. find them and did the same. That's what I not saying. likely. Okay. Not they, likely. What did they grind up and put and make the people drink? Drink it. That was when Moshe uh, came down and found them worshiping the golden calf. And he had it melted back down, ground it up, and, and forced the children of Israel who were worshiping it to drink it. Yes. Is this not yes. the same thing? In, in chapter 33 of Exodus, it is. But I went back to Genesis, back okay. to our where we're at on our journey with Jacob, back to Baal, to the house of God. And no, oh, Exodus well, was well, just giving you an example of how these earrings were part of, of false worship of another god. By, by drinking them, would that, would that kill them? It probably made them very sick to their stomach. But apparently it didn't kill them because we're not told it killed them off. But... You know, I imagine it gave them a good like stomach ache and, Jones. you know, made them <laughs> think for a little while about what they did. And I think the idea was that they were internally filthy. It wasn't just an external act, but they were internally filthy and needed to be cleansed. So best I can tell you, I don't know. I haven't studied that in depth, but good questions. Shows me your minds are thinking. So I, I'm sure that Jacob didn't just bury a you know, a few feet down. I'm sure he dug, everything was thrown in, it was covered up, it was, you know, flattened, and they moved on. Being nomadic people, who knows how long before somebody else would come through into that area, we never read about them being dug up, being discovered, or anything like that. And they would probably deteriorate in that ground. It might take, you know, a long time. But anyway, I think it was the best way Jacob knew to get rid of them and not to allow there to be another use. I know someone that when she walked away from the religion of her youth, had a lot of paraphernalia in her house, and she talked about how she took them and threw them in the garbage can. And even when she did, she said, you know, there was a moment of fear within her that would something bad happen to her because of doing this? And she had to realize those, I, I'm cutting their power. I'm not allowing them to have that kind of power in my life. My God is greater. And, uh, and yet, you know, for her, the best way she could get rid of them was throwing them in the garbage can and letting them be taken out to the dump. So, you know, he didn't have a garbage can. There wasn't a dump truck coming. <laughs> the burning, <laughs> they could have been reused it, it, like into a... He, he, may have, <laughs> he may have broken them as much as he could. Some may not have been breakable. Ask him. That girl that Ask him. Oh, well, maybe she did. Somebody else could get him maybe back, she so. did. I think Rowena even shared with us openly about her background and and getting rid of what she she realized she she knew they were not harmless in the sense if she could fear that they there was any power there. She knew that that had had a hold that was now broken. Am I right? Am I saying it okay, Rowena? I got a <laughs> smile. She's halfway on my screen. <laughs> so, okay. Um, whatever he did, God honored it because he, they are leaving it behind. It's near Shechem, which means they, they're starting on their journey. It's not where they're, they're leaving it for the others. And nobody's left right now anyway. Remember, the men have been killed and the women have become their prisoners and will will be traveling with them. So... Uh, not to say that the others in the other surrounding <coughs> cities could not have come in, but I think that he would have done it in a way that was not advantageous for them. So best best that he could do. So as they journey, they've got rid of it. They're, <coughs> they're showing God. They're putting him first. They're moving forward to go where he is commanded. As they journey, there was a great terror upon the cities which were around them, and they did not pursue the sons of Yaakov, of Jacob. Apparently, there probably was a rage in these other cities over what had been done to the Shechemites. 
you know, remember Yaakov, Jacob was afraid, you know, the others will come after us because, you know, they're, they're uh, allies, they're, you know, buddies, they, you know, so he was afraid and apparently he had a right to be afraid um, that they would come after them seeking revenge for those that had been killed. But whatever, God apparently set something in motion that so filled with fear the people who would have gone after them that no one did. No one came. Now, all we're told is it was a great terror. Somehow God put the fear, the fear of God, let me just put it that way, was in their hearts not to touch this people. We have seen and heard other stories like that where we know God has acted in that way and that's all I can say is that God acted very strongly here to hold them back, to protect Jacob as he had promised he would protect Jacob so that they did not pursue. They could not take revenge. I don't think they even started out. It doesn't say that. It just says there was a great terror. And they would have far outnumbered Jacob and his, his people, even though he had a big group flocks and maid servants and man servants and all that he still would have been far outnumbered if the other cities had all come together and come against him the jewish people would have been wiped out so whatever god did it it stopped them from being able to go after them sadly it did not endear the god of israel to those hearts these people who were heathen and lost in their sin were not seeing Yaakov's God as, um, I want to say this the right way, They're, they feared this God. They feared what he could do to them rather than knowing about the love of God. So there's been no testimony with Jacob living there close to 10 years. There's been no testimony to who Jacob's God is, that he's a God who does love, a God who does save, a God who does protect, a God who does care for. They, we don't hear any of that. All we see is that they're held back out of a fear. Now, did it open their eyes to the one true and living God? God alone knows, and God's not willing that any should perish, so if so he, he brought the truth to them in another way. Remember the, the um, I guess we call him the king in Egypt, when Abraham, uh, you know, uh, allowed Sarah to go into the harem and the, the, the leader, the pharaoh, whatever I should call him, in a dream was told, you're dead, man. You know, you touch her, you're dead. You know, we don't know whether he came to worship the God that spoke to him <laughs> or not. But these men were not living the example they should have been living is what I'm saying. But we do see Yaakov making the right change. He's now turning. We need to turn from, the, from anything to the one true and living God. We need to obey his word completely, every bit of his word. Dot your I's, cross your T's. It's to be a complete obedience, and that's what he is doing. And probably with this fear, this terror, this rage, whatever it was, the men in the other cities probably... Their re final response was, good riddance, let them go, get them out of here, we want nothing to do with them. If you need the reference where Jacob was fearing retaliation, it was chapter 34 and verse 30, by the way. But, so, they continue on their journey that no one is pursuing them. So, verse 6, Yaakov, Jacob came to Luz, that is Baal, Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. It's interesting that Luz, the original name for Beit El, for Beth El, means departure. So it seems that, that he must return to the place where he's departed from God's fellowship. He's not, I'm not saying that he's totally disobedient, but he's not in full obedience until he comes back to where God met him. But it's also interesting that the name Luz is used with the almond tree. And in that, the almond tree is a picture of resurrection. Yes? Okay, I didn't understand. Is it Luz or is it a Bethel that's... Um, the, they're one and the same. Luz was the original name, and Jacob gives it the name Bethel. Oh. oh. Okay, so, and Luz meant departure. And in oh. Jacob's mind, he might have thought of departing from fully obeying God. But he wants to call it the house of God. He's coming back to the place where he knows God met him. 
And since lose is also used not just to mean departure, but it's also used when they refer to the almond tree, they'll refer to the lose. I don't know if I'm saying that exactly right, but you get my, my drift. And that almond tree is a picture of resurrection. Now, how do I get that the almond tree is a picture of resurrection? Go with me to Numbers, Bamidbar in our Hebrew, Numbers chapter 17, and we'll see. You're very familiar with the story, but hopefully now it's going to take on even new meaning for you, more depth. In chapter 17 of Numbers, verse 1, then the Lord, Adonai, spoke to Moshe, Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and get from them a rod for each father's household, twelve rods from all their leaders according to the father's households. You shall write each name on his rod and write Aharon, Aaron's name on the rod of Levi, of Levi. For there is one rod for the head of each of their father's households. So, twelve tribes, including Levi as one of the tribes, each is to have a rod. They're to have their names on it. Aaron's to represent the house of Levi. And they're to take those rods now. And those rods were branches, dead branches that, that came off of an almond tree. And I say dead because they're broken off of the almond tree. So they're to take that, that rod, that dead branch, and verse 4, deposit them in the, it was the tabernacle, the tent of meeting in front of the testimony, in front of the ark of the covenant where I meet with you. Remember, God's presence dwelt in front of the ark or, or you know, the, the, in, it, the cherry bean with their wings over the mercy seat, over the ark, that right there in the middle was to be where God's presence was. And that's where God would meet Moshe. So he's saying, bring those rods and put them in front of the ark of the covenant in the tabernacle. And uh, it'll be verse 5, it'll come about the rod of the man whom I choose will sprout. That will, thus I will lessen from upon myself the grumblings of the sons of Israel who are grumbling against you. What had happened is that the children of Israel were saying, it's a family thing. Moses, you, Aaron's your brother. You guys, you, you, you've taken the whole thing for yourselves. Who says that it should be just your family? And God was the one who had appointed them. God had said Moshe was to be the leader. When Moshe was afraid to speak, God conceded and gave him Aharon, his brother, and put him into the priestly where Moshe was the, the, the head leader. Um, they were in their two different roles. But God had chosen them, and yet the children of Israel were coming against them and saying, you know, it's all in the family. You, 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 what do you do to the deck? You stack the deck. You know, and so God's saying, okay, I'll show who my choice is. Each one of you tribes, you get one representative. It, everyone's going to be represented by a branch. Take that dead branch, put it in the ark, in front of the ark overnight, and the one who is my choice, that one will sprout. That one will come to life. Okay, so that's what's happening here. So Moses spoke to the, the uh, sons of Israel, verse 6. And all their leaders gave him a rod apiece for each leader according to the father's households, 12 rods with the rod of Aaron, Aharon, among their rods. So Moshe deposited the rods before the Lord in the tent of the testament, put them right in front of the ark, just like God had said. Now on the next day, he put them in there that night, the very next day, Moshe went into the tent of the testimony and behold, remember their names were on them, the rod of Aharon for the house of Levi, Levi had sprouted and put forth buds and produced blossoms and it bore ripe almonds. Mm -hmm. Wow. Isn't Aaron Moses' brother? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. And that's why they were saying, you, you stacked the deck, Moses. You chose somebody from your own family. We should have gotten, you know, somebody else in here should have been able to be represented. Mm -hmm. But God had chosen, not Moses. And so Aaron's rod, it, it blossomed, it budded, and it produced fruit overnight. Anybody ever seen something go that fast? <laughs> I have to say, our pastor went through that when he first took on ministry. Uh, his family, was it, they were musical inclined, they were worship, but some of the people Came murmured and complained and thought it was favoritism, but they were, and they caused the church later on to split. Sadly, sadly. And it did hurt the oldest son because he was a Christian and he was accused. Oh. And 
and it brought up his past and it split the church. Which is sad. And here it has a good so ending pray here. pray for Bobby because he's never come back oh, from being okay. so wounded. Okay, yeah, Lord heal him even now. But this life out of death, that's what it was a picture of. Again, remember they cleansed themselves, the life out of death, the cleansing and the, the purifying. So at this place where resurrection is shown, this is where God meets man. This is where God cleanses us. He cleanses us through the shed blood of Yeshua, Jesus. And that's what is being alluded to here with Baal. With the name change, it's if, if it represents the almond tree, that's a great picture because this is the new life. This is the spiritual Jacob. This is the spiritual life that we all can have as we come into full obedience with our Lord. Okay, so the almond tree represents new new birth. Yes, resurrection, resurrection, oh. new birth, new life. Yes, yes. Okay, so. Jacob, back in chapter 28, changed the name of Luz to Bethel, to Bethel, to the, the house of God. He did that, you know, when he awakened from his dream and he made the altar and dedicated it to the Lord. Now he's going to add on a little bit more, <laughs> okay? So keep that in mind, but let's go back to chapter 35. And Jacob, in verse 6, has come to Luz, that is to Bethel, in the land of Canaan, he and all the people that were with him. So his whole family, his whole entourage, everybody has now come to Baal. What does he do at Baal? Good for him. He's got, he's on track again. Then he built an altar there and he called the place El Bethel. El Bethel. Okay, so now he's adding on just a little more dimension. El is the strong <laughs> God. Elohim, mm -hmm. you know, El is the short form. Mm -hmm. uh, El, the strong God of Baal, the house of God. The emphasis being now on God. It's not just on the place, but it's on God. It's God, God of the place. So it's not just like, oh, this is a, a special place. We got to get right here. But the, it's putting the focus on the God who is represented here. So showing he's really leaning fully on God. And that's what we all need to do. When you're in a tight spot, you may not have a Baal, a place where you know you can run back to and say, I know God met me here. But in your heart and in your spirit, you can't. You can go back to where you know you got off track with the Lord if you did. Or where you just felt the strong presence of the Lord, where he used certain verses in your life before. Go back to those verses. Put your focus on God on the Word of God and on God Himself and let Him strengthen you in that place. Because what does God do here when this happened? He built the altar because there God had revealed Himself when He had fled from His brother. It doesn't say it here. There, oh, 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 okay, okay, it does. I'm confusing the two times. He built an altar there the first time because God appeared to him there. Now He's building the altar again and He's saying it's God. The God of Bethel, this is the one. And he's just, it's just bringing to life that new resurrection, that new, he's really fully in sync with the Lord in obedience, and the Lord is appearing to him. We're going to see that because the Lord is going to appear to him here. Um, in fact, verse 9, let me cheat and say it and then get your question. Verse 9, then God appeared to Yaakov again. We don't read that God appeared to him in Shechem. We know he was in the land, he was doing right, but not 100% right. But now that he's back at Baal, where God wanted him to come, now God appears to him again. So, you know, if you think you're right, ask the Lord if he reveals to you, you know, you're good 90%, but I need 10% more, go for it. And get to that point where you've got the full appearance and as, uh, assurance. God is, is, you're right where God wants you to be. So if a Jacob would have went where God told him, his daughter never would have been raped. His sons then would have, they did because. Because the daughter would have been, right. That's, that's the whole thought that's behind it. Disobedient. And sometimes we're not meaning to be disobedient. And that's what I was trying to point out. I'm not sure that Jacob meant to be disobedient when he stopped there. But sometimes we do in the fatigue of our human flesh we we justify or we let down you know whatever reason we don't know exactly why Jacob settled 
he probably gave himself good reasons, and we gave good reasons when we talked about it. He was tired. But, yeah, yeah, easily. The flesh can get in the way, but he should have moved on. If, if he, they needed to stop for a short time, that's not 10 years. 10 years isn't short, <laughs> okay? Even if they lived longer, 10 years still isn't a short time. You'd be surprised how 10 years can fly. <laughs> oh, tell me. I, I'm old enough, I do know. A decade goes in a heartbeat now. <laughs> Did you still have a question? Uh, well, I was just going to say, so this is oh. the second time that he's been on this place, except now it elevated a little bit more. He really believes in God. And he's learned to really lean on him now. That's, that's the difference. It, it's like any of us, when we first get saved, we know God, we're believing in God. But 10 years later, and I don't, I'm just using 10, you know, but years later, we should have a deeper walk with God. And we should be able to go through harder trials really leaning on God. If you're not growing in your walk, something is wrong. Jacob wasn't growing in Shechem. He was full of fear. He wasn't trusting fully. He needed to get back on that track that keeps him growing in the Lord, leaning on the Lord, fully obedient to the Lord. And we need that also. And we need to realize it's too easy to get just a little complacent and not really realize it, get lulled to sleep. I'm reminded, and I haven't read it in years, I read the, both the children and adult form in the children's book, A Pilgrim's Progress. You know, they're going through, the pilgrim is on the journey to the celestial city, which is heaven. So it's the journey of life for them to get home. And just before they, I think it's the last chapter before they hit the celestial city, they come into this open area and they just kind of fall into this lull, and they just want to sleep, you know, they're just... And it was the last ploy that Satan had to throw at them to keep them from getting to the promised land. So it's that idea. We can get lulled into faults, you know, well, I'm, I'm doing what God wants. I, I'm, I've got my kids in church, and I'm going to church, and, you know, I'm busy about my life, but, but God's in it. Okay, is he fully in control? Is he saying, I want you here, and you're saying, oh, well, I'm doing this here for you, God. You want to be fully 100% in compliance, and that's what we're seeing. Jacob finally is learning. Remember, he's a mixture between his spiritual and his flesh, and we all are. And the one that you feed the most is the one that's going to win out. You know, if you feed your flesh, the flesh is going to be strong. If you feed your spirit, the spirit's going to be strong. So we, too, need to learn to lean hard on God and especially when you're in a tight place. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He will direct your path. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. So, here we go. He is, he's come all the way back. He has made an altar again. He's honored his God, where God revealed himself to him. And then we uh, read in verse 8 something very sad. Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, has died. And she was buried below Bethel, Baal, under the oak, and it was named Alon Bakut. Okay? Now, she hasn't been mentioned since chapter 24. In fact, 24 and verse 59, if you want. So we've gone a long time without hearing anything about her. Um, she's got to be old. No offense to her. But Jacob, if he left, at, he was, let's just say around figure 75, 75 to 77, when he left for Panama. He's gone 20 years. That put him 95. If there's another 10 years in Shechem, that's 105. Rebecca would have been his mom's handmaid, her, her, the right hand that would have helped rear him. So she was old enough to be a mother. So she had to be up there in age. Um, and, and she has now died. Go ahead, Dora. Is it the same oak as he buried the other stuff? No. No, because they've moved from that. So, yeah, no, it's not. Okay. Um, say what? Buried her with all the gold. Oh, with all, yeah. No, no, because they had moved on. Remember, they were just outside of Shechem when he buried the, the earrings and the, the false idols and all that. And now they've moved all the way to Bay El. You know, well, the, the reason the I ask you because, like, it's, it's a special oak. It's not just a... You know, I will talk about the oak in just a minute. I'll go okay. just a okay. little a little before you let me say a little bit more about Rebecca. Okay. 
why did she join Yaakov's household? When did she join Yaakov's household? When did she become part of Jacob's group? Because here we're going to see that she's with him. He's the one that buries her. How did she suddenly get there? Because when we left her, she was not part of Jacob's group. Okay, then go back to chapter 24 and verse 59. In fact, maybe we need to do that so you get my point. Genesis 24 and verse, whoops, I went to, oh, okay, I'll just go back a chapter. Sure, well, easier said than done. There we go. I try to get my tablet to cooperate, and it's me. Chapter 24 and verse 59. Okay. Um, then let me see where I need to jump in. Okay. This is when Rebecca has been asked if she's willing to go to be with Isaac, to be his wife. The servant has come to get her, to get a wife for Isaac, remember? And she's never seen Isaac. She goes on face value what the servant tells her about him. And the servant's in such a hurry to fulfill his, his duty to Abraham, his master, that once he knew that Rebecca was the right one because he made that prayer by the well and she did exactly what he prayed the right one would do, the, she was ready to go. Then he was like, okay, let's set out the next morning. And the family's like, let's, let, whoa, slow down. Let's give her a little bit, you know, give her a couple of weeks. Let her get used to that she's going to leave her family and go. Is she willing to go this quickly? And so they, they came to her and asked her. And uh, um, they said in verse 57, they called the girl and asked, consult her wishes. Then they called Rebecca and said, will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. She was ready. She didn't hesitate. She didn't say, well, give me a little bit of time. Maybe the servant was afraid to change her mind. I don't know, but she was ready. She was sold out. This was right for her, and she was going to go. So they sent away Rebecca and her nurse with Abraham's servant and his men. So Rebecca sets out to go to Beersheba to meet Isaac, become Isaac's wife, and her handmaid, which is called her nurse, and if she was even old enough to be more of a... Of a um, mentor, a helper, a, a caretaker to Rebecca, then she's even older than I just said. Um, but she went right along with Rebecca. So she's gone to Isaac's house with Rebecca. She lived there. She lived with Isaac and Rebecca. I'm sure they had their own little tents, you know, but she lived there. Now Jacob, the one who left Isaac's home, went to Padan Aram, has now come back to Beit El, He's not come back to his father, and he's not living with his father yet. We don't read that. He hasn't gotten there yet. We're going to see when he um, meets up to live in Isaac's area, okay? It's, he's close, but he's not there yet. So, Rebecca has died. The nurse, or the handmaid, or whatever we should call her, is has been living with Isaac and his people, you know, his group, not with Jacob. So how do we suddenly get her over here with Jacob? Okay, there's a reason why I'm bringing it out. Um, did she leave Isaac's tent? Let's call it that, okay? It's more than just a tent, but let's see. Did she leave Isaac's tent to come to Jacob and inform Jacob when Rebekah had died? Because we don't read about Rebecca's death. We read that she died, but we don't read about her death. And I'll show you that in a moment also. Did she come with the last message from Rebecca to her son? Or did she join at a different time? Did she join when he came to Beit El? Or when he was living in Sukkot, in Shechem, in that area? Because apparently there was some back and forth between Isaac, Esau, and um, Jacob before Isaac dies. We're going to see that there's, it, it talks like there's, they've been in communication with each other. And I think that's likely what it is. What purpose would Rebecca have in leaving and coming and staying with Jacob? I think it happened when Rebecca died because now her responsibility had ended. Rebecca was who she was to care for when she left and came and stayed in Isaac's tent. She came with Rebecca to be, to be a, a helper to Rebecca. So now her responsibility is over, 
and she must have felt a closeness, I think, to Jacob, maybe more than she felt to Isaac, even though she'd stayed in his tent for so long. She took care of Jacob. She helped Rebecca with Jacob. She probably had a hand in raising him. He probably was like a son to her. Like a grandmother. Yeah, yeah, like a grandma thing maybe even, yeah. And so I think there was a special relationship between them. I think she missed him. And I think when he came back and he was close enough now, she had no reason to stay in Isaac's tent. He's an old man. He's got his people around. He didn't need her. She gravitated to stay with That's Jacob. Rebecca. Yeah, Rebecca's nurse. nurse yeah. Rebecca's nurse. But it would not have happened before Rebecca had passed away. There's no way. She would have stayed and been, been you know, helping Rebecca <coughs> and taking care of Rebecca. So I think the reason why we get this is to indicate to us that there was connection, communication, and visiting between Jacob and his father Isaac. I think that probably numerous times, I think when Isaac said to, e I'm sorry, I'm sorry, when Jacob said to Esau, I'll meet up with you in Seir, I think he did. I think he didn't mean I'm going to go live with you in Seir when he sent Esau on and said, you know, my little ones can't go. I think he went and visited. I think he went back and forth a couple different times. I thought he didn't because he said he looked the other way. Right. To because avoid going, I thought. I don't think it was to avoid going. I think he went the other way because his intent was true. He wanted to take care of his family. He wanted the flocks to have pasture. The pasture was good there. Another reason why he settled in Shechem, an area where he shouldn't have, but another reason why he did, I think, was the pasture was good. He settled, so he went to the direction Esau was going to desert. He knew that he's going to where there, there was better pasture, better, better place for the family to catch their breath. If he had been trying to pull a fast one on Esau, if he had been trying to sneak that he wasn't going to meet with him, why would he immediately go in the opposite direction? That would have been a red flag to Esau right away. Hey, he's not meaning business. Like Jonah, when Jonah went the other way, he got in the ship and he went the opposite direction of what God told him to go. Uh, I don't remember the the if it was if he was supposed to go north and he went south. Okay, <laughs> Jacob in essence did the same thing. If he had been trying to hide from his brother that I'm not you know going to trust you and I'm not going to do what I say, he would have made it look like he was moving in that direction. He would have you know camouflaged. He would have <laughs> stayed put, not moved any distance. But the fact that he moved in the other direction, I think he settled his family. And then there was no point in dragging everybody up to go see Esau. He's the one that had a connection with Esau. So just like we see nowadays with our families, someone wants to go visit a relative. Let's say it's the father of the family. The children are young. He wants to go visit his, his uncle. Okay, And it means an uh, airplane ticket. It means hotel lodging. You know, it's, there's a lot. Plus, his kids are little. It's going to be a hard trip with them. The kids have no connection to that great uncle. They, the, who is that? They don't care about going. So dad says, you know, I'll just go by myself. I'll go visit, and I'll have a good visit because I won't be worrying about my little ones. <laughs> and then I'll come back, you know, to the family. And I think that's what Jacob did a number of times. I think he visited back and forth. So he may have seen Rebecca. We're not told. We're never told about a reunion. But when people say, you know, Jacob paid the ultimate price, we don't know. He might have even seen his mother before she passed away. He definitely sees his father. We know that. But that's all scripture records for us. So just thoughts. I can't tell you I know this. <laughs> but reasoning it out with the other scriptures and scriptures that are coming that I will not get to today because I'm too wordy and started too late. But we, there, there's others that we'll see, and I'll show you that when we get to it, where it's obvious uh, Jacob and Esau have talked about what to do when dad dies. You know, the, it, there's been a communication that's been there. I think we tend to think in Bible times they didn't communicate. That remember, they knew things that were going on. They knew where to send the servant to get the bride. They knew, you know, go to... Uh, Uncle Laban's house, you know, they knew things where obviously I think as people did go through, whether they went through on a trade route or whatever, I think word passed, you know, 
there's just there's more of a communication than we're aware of call it pony express call it whatever you want but i think that there was so with rebecca having passed away the nurse would be free to do what she wanted to do she loved jacob probably for years it had that that closeness with him and so she went to stay with jacob because it would be just the two of them clinging together over the loss that was dear to both their hearts um, now there is no re record of rebecca's death i brought that out okay i think there's reason for that when we studied about Rebecca back in chapter 24, we saw that she was a picture or a type, we call it, of the church. The church is the bride of Christ, okay? Remember, she is the bride that was brought to Isaac. We're going to be brought to the son. The son is looking for his bride to come because remember, Isaac was out in the field. The son's going to come out of heaven call us up you know it's not that he's looking where are you but he, he's going to come meet us but the bride goes to meet the bridegroom rebecca is a beautiful picture of that go back to my study of chapter 24 to get all that detail well the church we don't read of the church's death the church is raptured we go in rapture so even though she did die we know she's buried in the cave of Machpelah where Abraham and Isaac and um, Sarah and Jacob and Leah all end up being buried. We know she's buried there. Chapter 49 of verse 31 refers to her being buried in the cave of Machpelah, but being that picture of the church is the picture of her being raptured rather than death. And the servant Rebecca. telling Rebecca, yes, bless you, the servant telling Rebecca about Isaac is a type of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit teaching us about our bridegroom, the, whole, the servant teaching Rebecca about the bridegroom Isaac and bringing her to meet him, the Holy Spirit's the one who brings us to meet our bridegroom in that day of rapture. So I think that's why God didn't let the death of Rebecca be told and recorded. We obviously read that it happened but not as it happened because that would ruin the picture. Church doesn't die. Church gets raptured. Church goes. Hallelujah. <laughs> okay. Am I clear? Yep. Am no, I as I'm clear good. as mud? Yep. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Okay, so where was she buried? Let's look at that. I've got to get back into Genesis 35. Yes, she was buried below Bethel under the oak. Okay, below what Bethel, you, uh, I am in oh, verse eight. 8. Chapter 35 and verse 8. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, Devo now Devorah is how we say it in Hebrew. Rebecca's nurse died. Rivka, if you want Rebecca in Hebrew. She died and she was buried below Bethel. That could literally mean south of Bethel, south of Bethel on the map, like just outside of Bethel. It could mean that. It could also mean she was buried in the ground <laughs> because she is buried under the oak, okay, or under an oak. So whichever way it's meant. But it could have been a hill. They it, lived a hill. It, it could have been. It could have been. It, as long as that oak was on a hill, she yeah, was right. buried <laughs> under the oak. Don't you, know. Don't know where it is to this day. But you don't see a, 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 if you read the history of the oak trees, they don't live on a hill because their roots, they really okay. expand. Okay. Okay. Good to have a, a, a what do we call them? Um, Arboretus oh. in our midst. <laughs> <laughs> My dad told her. dad taught her. <laughs> taught her well. <laughs> so the oak tree probably wasn't on a hill. Nope. She's buried under an oak. Um, in, which oak? It, it does make it sound like there was a specific one that was known because it says buried, you know, beneath the oak or under the oak, but we don't know any more than that. We don't have a marker place for it today. We know that he called the name alone the coot, and that means the oak of weeping, crying. The oak of the weeping? The oak of weeping, of crying. The oak of crying, the oak of weeping. So it shows 
Isaac, I'm sorry, Jacob, <laughs> I've got to get my name straight. Jacob must have been crying over her death. I think it broke his heart. You know, his mom has died. Now the, the one that was like a second mom or a grandma to him, whatever, however I should put it, he, he, was, he was grieving at her death. She was faithful to him, to his family. She was a, a highly esteemed uh, servant. She wasn't just a servant. She was part of the family. Mm -hmm. And so he grieved enough that, that he was crying and named the place the Oak of Weeping. Boo-hoo-hoo-wee. Okay? So uh, that's all we know, though. Um, I'll stress the difference. When Rachel dies, we know where she's buried to this day. I've been to her gravesite. But I can't go to Rebecca or the nurse's gravesite. Well, Rebecca, yes, I've been to Rebecca's also, the cave of Machpelah. But I can't go to Rebecca's nurse's <coughs> gravesite because I don't know where the oak is. <laughs> but, I mean, some of these people, their their burials are not in Jerusalem, is it? They're no. out. Yeah, like, Bethel is outside of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Rachel. I, mean, I didn't mean Jerusalem, but I meant uh, Israel. Oh, uh, some of them would have been. These happened that we're talking about right now were buried in Israel, in oh. the land of Canaan, as it was called at this point, yes. Because Baal, Bethel is in the land of Israel. Mm -hmm. so. Because sometimes it says you can't go uh, see them because they're under uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> under the Iran's rule or something like that. Under, yeah, yeah. If Yes, there are others that are, you know, outside. Paul lost his life in Rome. Rome's in Italy. Rome's not in Israel. Rome's in Italy, you know. So, yes, you know, back in this time, there wasn't in Italy, I don't believe, at this point, but you get my point. So, and I'm agreeing with you, not at all were buried there. Mm -hmm. But Abraham, Isaac, okay, let's do it this way. Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob and Leah, all six are buried in one location. Rebecca's nurse is not buried in that location, and um, Rachel. Rachel, thank you, <laughs> and Rachel is not in that location, but we do know where Rachel is. That's why I'm saying we, we just, all we can tell you is it's probably not far from Bethel, even if it's meaning south of Bethel, it must have been just right outside of Bethel, um, but, but she, has, she has died, he is weeping, and he goes on. Okay, so we'll go on, <laughs> because I think we said all we can. Verse 9, then God appeared again to Jacob, to Jacob, when he came down from Padan Aram, and he blessed him. Now here again, all the time that he was in Shechem, we don't read of God appearing to him. We know God spoke with him, we know that, that Jacob wasn't in total rebellion, but we don't see the blessing of God's appearance until this point. God first appeared to him here when he left for Padanaram. That's chapter 28. We can start with verse 13. That's the, the latter picture. And then in chapter 35 and verse 1, where God said, get moving, go to Bethel. But now that he is where he's supposed to be, it's, um, he'd left 30 years earlier for Padanaram. Now he's back there. Wow. And in this way, I'm going to say, now he's home. Now he's where God wants him to be. Yes, he's been in the land, but now he's home. Okay? When we kids were little, we went on a trip back east. It was a car trip. We went back to see family. We were gone almost a month. That's a long time in a little kid's life. And I remember when the car crossed on the freeway, crossed to where the border sign said, Welcome to California. <laughs> I think all our windows were down, and I think it, we were all hanging out a different window yelling, Yay, we're home. <laughs> now, we weren't in San Bernardino yet. But when you've been gone for a long time, and you see California, and you know you're on California soil, we're home. But now, really, he's home home. He's right where God wants him and he's really home. So yeah, I think he was home, but now he's really home. Okay, so um, yeah, okay, I think I've said that. All right, um, and I, I've got a note and I can't remember. Let's look real quick at Genesis 31, 13. I don't remember what it said. Maybe that's where God told him to go to Baal. 31 and verse 13. We read, 
I am the God of the El, where you anointed a pillar, where you made a vow to me. Now arise, leave this land, Shechem, return to the land of your birth, go back all the way to Beit El. So he's he's finally done it. He's he's arrived. <laughs> okay, so we've got him there, and God appears to him there. Um, his relationship has been restored with God. He's returned to his first love, some might say. But we read of that in Revelation 2, chapter, chapter 2, and verses 4 and 5. We're talking there about a church that God commended, but he also had a, a correction for them, that they had left their first love. Now, Jacob showed getting rid of the idols, getting rid of everything. He was showing that he was going back to that, 100% sold out for the Lord. That church that, that left its first love, usually people say that that's leaving your, your excitement, your thrill to, to wholeheartedly serve the Lord. You kind of, you know, first it's all exciting and new, and then you settle down and you don't quite give it your full. And that's what's being encouraged here is God wants us fully. We, he wants us 100% where we are right, where he can bless us fully. You want all God's blessing? Be all where he wants you to be. Don't be part, but be all. And in this, and he's going to call him Israel because he's looking at his spiritual character. He's going to renew that covenant to Yaakov, to Jacob. He's not giving it to him for the first time. He's reaffirming it. He's renewing it. And that's what's going to be his comments here. So God's appearing to him um, when he came from Padan Aram as if to say, now that your trip's over, now that you've come back home, I'm blessing you and said to him, your name is Jacob. No longer, oops, you shall no longer be called Yaakov, Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. Okay, now we've gone through this before. It's not new to uh, Jacob, but it is, you know, he's he's beginning to see when God's calling him Israel, he's talking about his spiritual and his spiritual state. And he's affirming that to him. You're not just the flesh, Jacob. You are the spiritual, Jacob. Let's call you by that name. Let's get you, you know, your mindset all on the spiritual. So he, God, called him Israel. That's verse 10. And God also said to him, um, before I get there, when he was first called Israel was chapter 32 and verse 28. And it's a reminder of Jacob of that new character, that his flesh has been touched by God so that he's now a new character. He's not going in the flesh, he's going in the spirit. The same way when we get saved, we have a, we're a new creation. We have that new spirit within us that enables us to live a spiritual life. Can't do that without the spirit. And that's what God is showing here is here's the change. And now that you have that touch spiritually, you're Israel. And he's going to bless him as Israel. And he's going to remind him of the covenant that he's made with him. And tell him to, to walk worthy of that even as we're to walk worthy of the covenant that we've made with God when we've entered into salvation with him. We don't work for our salvation, but we work out our salvation so that we're pleasing to God. Now, when we look at the name Israel, and I've gone through this some before, so this is just pretty much a summary on it, but when we look at it, there's many um, definitions given to it, and they're not wrong. It's that when we look at the root words, it, that, are, that Israel comes off of the root, and when you change and look at different vowel markings, you get even more meanings. I think because God's wanting to say more than just one thing. It's not just one simple, this is what the name means. It means this, it means this, it means this, it means this. So just looking at it again, let me remind you, it does mean God rules. That's one of the common that we hear. God is ruling in Yaakov's life now, so he's acting as Israel. It also meant one who strives with God. We knew that Jacob struggled, you know, with God, and we see the meaning of that. But let me take you into those root words. We see Israel. El, we already know, is the strong God. We've just talked about that at Beit El. El is the strong God. When we see the, the in the Isra, we can see the root Sarah. Well, some say Shara. 
it, but it's the same root because remember we're taking Hebrew letters onto an English alphabet. Now that is very interesting because when you see that root, that means that it's something that's rigid that wouldn't normally be able to absorb and retain liquids. But what we're seeing here is it is able to absorb and it is able to retain. And I'll tell you why that, what we get from that in a moment. <coughs> sar also, Sarah, I've told you, Sar can, is feminine. The name Sarah, Sarah is Sar. And we say that that meant that she was a princess. It, it, did, it does indicate rulership again, which takes us back to God rules. But when it's put with the yeh in front of it, Yisrael, that turns it into a verb rather than a noun. And it, it's, it, this is really difficult to get in English and understand, and I don't want to just confuse you. But the idea is, if, if somebody says, we named him Bob because it seemed like a good idea, that doesn't mean that the name Bob means it's a good idea, <laughs> okay? There was a reason behind the name, and the idea is that Israel could now be a ruler, a prince with God. He's now able to retain what was fluid before and would have gone through him. He's able to retain it and be, and I'll put it this way, a receptacle for God to work through. That resonates with me because I know God says that he's made us vessels to be to work through for his purpose he makes some good vessels he makes some bad vessels to serve the purpose that he is intending but when we allow the spirit to have that control as Jacob's learning to do then we become a vessel that the spirit can move through can work through can flow through and that's what I think is showing us in that name he is now becoming a vessel that God can put his spirit in him and work through him and do his purposes and that's a beautiful name then to have it's not just a struggle it's becoming that receptacle that God can use and then God prevails God rules God wins Go ahead. Okay, so this is the second time because the first time was when he wrestled with him, and this, this is yes. the second time. Yes. Yeah. In essence, you, you haven't blown it. You, I didn't take it away from you. I'm reassuring you. And you're moving now into that capacity that was opened up then. Because remember when he clung to him and said, I'm not going to let go until you bless me? Uh -huh. He knew who he was wrestling with. He knew it's all over. I'm done. I'm toast. <laughs> he can do anything he wants with me, but I'm not letting go <laughs> till you bless me. So he is a prince with God. He was one who struggled and wrestles with God. But now let's put it all together with the Israel and all those different roots and all those different meanings in there. And you really have a, a more like a whole sentence in the name. And you have a, literally in there a turning of the head. Remember, it's becoming a receptacle now that God can work through. But the, the, the sar can also be the turning of the head. If you're the prince, everybody has to do what you say. You're the head, okay? You turn, the others have to, to, um, have to listen to what you're saying. We also see figuratively when Sarah was given that name, she turned heads with her beauty. <laughs> okay? So we've got a turning the head. We've got an attention going to this one because when we relate in there to the root Yashar, which is Yasar, which is in there, the, the Yet and the Sar, and we come together with those two, we have the Hebrew word meaning righteous, straight, just. So you have a righteous ruler here, one who's dealing straight. This isn't a crooked path, dealing straight. And in our Hebrew grammar with that Y in front, making it verb rather than noun, now we have an essence that God's head, he stops and he turns his head as if this one who strives with him, who's learning to be a character that God's spirit can move through, has turn to God and, and is requesting something and God's turned his head and looked at his son and said what do you need son what do you want 
And in that, that's beautiful, that relationship that's there. It's not a, I'm going to fight it out. It's, what do you need, son? You've got my attention. My head is turned toward you. My spirit is in you to work through you to accomplish my purposes. What's your need? I'm L, your, your, your strong God that will supply all you need. Is that not beautiful to see all of that in the name Israel? And oh, I can't wait till the whole nation of Israel lives that out. So we have the, the prince, we have the head, we have the receptacle, we have all of these meanings in this name. Whether Yaakov understood all that, I think he's learning. I think he's growing, but I think he's realizing I'm not who I was. I'm not yet who I should be, but I'm not who I was. And that's the key. God is assuring him, you are growing, son. You are changing. You are becoming more spiritual. You are letting go of the flesh. And he's encouraging him that, in that. So we're going to call you that way. And who is saying it? Who called him Israel? God says to him in verse 11, I am El Shaddai. I am God Almighty. El Shaddai is the all-sufficient one. And if I took another hour to give you the whole meaning behind that name, it has so much to it also. But if I try to put it in just a little nutshell, it's the nourisher and the nurturer. The nourisher is like the mama who feeds the baby from her breast. She is nourishing her baby. God is nourishing us right from his breast. He is nourishing us. And he is nurturing us, helping us to grow in his sufficiency. Because remember, we're a receptacle now that God can flow through in his spirit to accomplish his purposes. So, wow, what God is promising Yaakov here is just off the map. And when we see it and embrace it and realize, no longer should you be saying, I can't do that, God. I'm afraid to speak. I'm afraid to go. I won't know what to say. They'll look at me funny. They might get mad at me. They might slam a door in my face. They might shoot me. That's a little scarier than the door getting slammed. But all that should be gone. Because whatever lies Satan puts in your mind, you should tell yourself, I'm no longer the flesh. I'm the new creature, the new creation. I am the Israel rather than the Jacob now. And my God, who can give me everything I need, nourishes and nurtures. Mama gives everything that baby needs. You've got this, God. And we go in the joy of our salvation. It's a beautiful picture and a beautiful name. And I'll tell you honestly, I don't think I've gotten it all yet. <laughs> I feel like I've got my ABC started, but there's a whole litany of alphabet letters to follow as we study and learn more the depth of, of these names. I've had the Lord just absolutely open up scripture to me this week, a lesson that I taught last Friday that's still blowing me away, and I still am well aware. I've been in these verses before, but never seen this depth, the connection. God is amazing. I had to learn this so I could learn this. I had to learn this so I can learn this. I had to learn this yeah. so I can go even deeper. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's what we're doing. And wow, wow. I just, I, I feel like we're just beginning. I can't wait for that new mind. I can't wait to, we can sit, at, as we were saying earlier, at his feet for a, a thousand years, a million years if you want, and say, now we know what this all means. Whoa. Couldn't contain it now. Couldn't contain it. Even if we are a receptacle, it gets full. <laughs> but what a God. What a name. And he's promising him everything. I've got it all. I'm your sufficient one. I'm the one who makes it possible for you to walk in the newness of life. I'm reaffirming of you. I'm going to reaffirm what I'm going to do through you. I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to make you a people. Through you, all the world's going to be blessed. Is it through Jacob? No, it's through his seed. And I say it singular. Because how is the whole world blessed? Through the Savior. Through Yeshua. Through Jesus. So where does he go? Right there. Be fruitful and multiply. Do life, Jacob. Live it, okay? I've revealed myself to you. And oh, by the way, I use this name with your grandfather, Abraham. 
In chapter 17 and verse 1, I told him I was El Shaddai. I told your father Isaac. It's recorded in chapter 28 and verse 3. And now I'm telling you, I'm El Shaddai to Avraham. I'm El Shaddai to Yitzhak. I'm El Shaddai to Yaakov. And he's telling us today, I'm El Shaddai to you too. Isn't that beautiful? The strong one who nourishes and nurtures and meets your every need. Notice I didn't say meets some needs or a need. He meets your every <clears throat> need. That's your need today. That's your need tomorrow. And only he knows what that need is. And he's already working in Jacob, bringing him up, strengthening him in him, because Jacob is going into hard times. He doesn't know it yet, but he is. He's going to go from a hard time to a hard time. The same way we do as believers today, you're either in a trial, coming out of the trial, we're going into a trial. It's just the nature of our lives down here. So be encouraged. I'm going to make you a great nation. The nation of Israel is a nation today because God keeps his word. He says, I'm going to make you a multitude of nations. That would be the 12 tribes. It could be the kingdoms. It could be meaning Judah and Israel. It could be meaning any number of things. But there was going to be the nation and there's going to be uh, kingdoms come from, from this nation. He also promises him kings, I think, here, doesn't he? Yes, and yes. kings shall come from you. He promised that to Abraham and Sarah. He told them in chapter 17 and verses 6 and 16, he said that kings would come from their loins. And that's what he says here also. Um, and, and kings shall come from you. Kings will come out of your loins. They'll come forth from you. And, and don't miss it. And the land which I gave to Abraham and to Isaac, I will give to you, and I will give the land to who? Hello, world. Yes. Hello, world, to your descendants after you. Yes. Who has a right to that land? Israel has a right to that land. And all who come from Israel have a right <clears throat> to that land. And we need to pray for Israel. Oh, yes, yes. And we need the world to understand and quit trying to kick her out of the land God has given her. That's her rightful land. He reaffirms the promise of the land. He reaffirms it will go past Jacob to his descendants. It would pass on to all his 12 sons. Up to this point, it passed from father to son, Abraham to Isaac. From Isaac to son Jacob, but from Jacob is going to pass to 12 sons, and the 12 sons we are going to see do enter the promised land. They're not fully in all of their land yet. We know they've been kicked out, gone into captivity for their rebelliousness and their sin. We know God has started a regathering, but they will fully all come back into their complete land much larger than the map ever has been, except way back when God first declared. But all of this is being promised, all of this. Then God went up from him at the place where he had spoken to him. That's a sad verse, except that's a great verse. <laughs> because it shows us this wasn't a dream, this wasn't a vision, this wasn't anything someone could later say, well, you thought that, Jacob, or you dreamt that up, what did you eat? No, this shows that it was an actual happening, that God was actually there, revealed himself to him, a theophany, God in human form, verse, uh, verse 13. That, and then God went up from him at the place where he had spoken with him. So he left him, in essence. God his, took his presence back into heaven. Um, like I said, that's a bit sad to me, but... What does Jacob do? He recognized this is a holy place. He made an altar before, and here we go. So Yaakov, Jacob, set up a memorial stone in a place where he had spoken with him, a memorial of stone. He poured out a drink offering on it. He also poured oil on it. And Jacob, Yaakov, named the place where God had spoken with him, Baal. Again, it's not the first time he's naming it. He's declaring it again, though. This is the house of God. That's what he's saying. First time we've had mention about a drink offering, though. Why, what does this mean? By the time the children of Israel go into the promised land, they get instructions on the sacrifices. They get many instructions. And we have the drink offering referred to. 
I'm going to take you through that real quickly. If I have to hurry, I don't think I, I think I can do it quickly and do it justice. If not, I'll pick it back up, not next week, but the week after, because unfortunately we had that break. But go with me to Numbers chapter 15, verses 5 to 7. Numbers 15, verses 5 to 7. Numbers chapter 15, verse 5 through 7. Verses, okay? And you shall prepare wine for the drink offering, one-fourth of a hen with a burnt offering for the sacrifice for each lamb, or for a ram you shall prepare as a grain offering, two-tenths of an oil and fine flour mixed with one-third hen of oil. I'm trying to hurry through it. Verse 7. And for the drink offering you shall offer one-third of a hen of wine as a soothing aroma to the Lord. Okay? There's also other references. Um, they're not at my fingertips. I'll give them to you later that refer to the drink offering. So here is being mentioned, later we get the detail about it, but we need to understand the symbolism of it. What does this mean? The drink offering was always poured out. It was never drunk, okay? But it is liquid form. It, it was referred to as wine here. It was to be a type of Christ, a picture of, of Messiah, a picture of Yeshua, whose soul was poured out unto death. His blood literally poured out. Let me show you where I get that. Go with me to Isaiah, Yeshua, Isaiah 53 and verse 12. I think many of you are familiar that chapter 53 is a picture of the sacrificial lamb, the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. But specifically for our point right now, in verse 12, God saying, Therefore I will allot him, Yeshua, a portion with the great, he will divide the booty with the strong because he poured out himself to death, was numbered with the transgressors, yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. Don't miss on it in that he himself poured himself out. He was numbered with the sinners because he took on the sin of the world so that he might intercede for the sinners because his blood was perfect. But he poured his own life out. The Jews didn't do it. Even the Romans didn't do it. Everybody wants to point a finger and blame and they want to pass a judgment and say the Jews killed Christ. You shouldn't have a thing to do with them. You have all these comments made today. The Lord willingly poured himself out. He poured himself out knowing he was going to do that. He gave them the drink offering to be a picture of him, of pouring himself out. So when the wine was poured out on the altar, it was a picture of the Lord's sacrifice of himself being poured out. And then it's brought home when we have Shaol tell us, Paul, tell us, imitate me as I imitate the Messiah. He says that in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1. Okay, when, when I'm acting like the Messiah, then act like me. I'm your example. And how did he consider his life? What kind of an example do we see in Shaul Paul? Go with me to Philippians 2 and verse 17. Philippians 2 and verse 17. Philippians 2, 17, where we read, But even, and Paul speaking, but even if I'm being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and I share my joy with you all. Paul saying, if I have to suffer, if my life is being poured out so that your faith grows, <coughs> rejoice, <coughs> rejoice. That's something to be uh, shared with joy with you all. I'm happy to do it for you. Did the Lord begrudgingly pour out his life for no. us? No, he did it with a joy, with, with, uh, he was, how did it say here, rejoice and share my joy with you all. Look at 2 Timothy 2, uh, 2 Timothy, sorry, verse 4, chapter 4, I'm trying to hurry, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 6. Timothy was his son in the faith. Timothy, Paul loved him like a father and was nurturing him to grow in the grace of the Lord. And he said again in chapter 4 of 2 Timothy, verse 6, For I, Paul, am already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure has come. Paul knew he was facing death. He knew that if something didn't happen miraculous, he was going to lose his life for his faith. 
And he was saying that to Timothy, I'm being poured out like that drink offering, a picture of the Lord pouring out his life that we might have life. And as Paul was doing it, he said, I rejoice if it brings you faith, if it helps you grow in your faith, if you learn, learn as I am an example of Messiah, fully giving my life to you. So when we take that back into Genesis chapter 35, and we have Jacob giving, uh, pouring out a drink offering, he is in essence picturing because it's a foreshadow for him. He's looking to the cross when Messiah will pour out his life. And he is doing it in essence saying, I am with him pouring out my life that I might be one with the Lord, that I would be pleasing to him and that I would be, it's with all joy as I spiritually sacrifice anything for my Lord. When we look at the technical of it, the, the drink, um, it said it was a third or a fourth or a half part of a hen, depending on which drink offering you were doing. And a hen is six quarts, so it was either, um, where's my note? So it was either one and a half quarts or two quarts or three quarts of liquid that's being poured out. So it wasn't just a little cup being dropped, it was a pouring out that they could see, visually see this being poured out on the altar as a sacrifice. We read it in, and here's my other scriptures for you. I took you to Numbers 15. Keep reading there. We, we read 5 through 7. Go through 10. Read also in Exodus 29, verses 40 and 41. And read about it in Leviticus 23, 13. Well, what's and it, Acts again? Because I don't have that. It's, it's on here. It's on your cross-references. It's, Does that have anything? No, to there's do? no Acts here. Not Acts. When Exodus. They, oh, when Exodus, they okay. poured out the water that... What the these uh, subjects, whatever you want to call them, went down to get him the water. Oh. David said he wanted. Then he poured it out on the ground. That's right. different. That that was a different. That wasn't. He David didn't offer it on the altar of sacrifice. David was even upset with his men that they took such a chance of losing their own lives thinking they were doing something nice for David, but he was showing them, that's not what I'm asking you to do. I'm not asking you to put your neck on the line just to get me a drink of water. But here, and then I'll get your question. Here, what we're seeing is a picture of the Lord pouring out his life. Jacob was saying, I, you know, I'm pouring out my life to be in line with my Messiah. I look to him and I see he's the one who gave his life. And even wine, the fruit of the land, wine is a symbol of joy to to. Uh, Israel in our commandments and in all of our all that we do and here we see the Lord in joy lay down his life not begrudgingly he did it in joy and in essence Jacob's dedicating that land because he's on that land that place where God's met him he's dedicating it to God God who is going to pour forth who's going to bring his son to this land who will pour out his blood in this land to bring this land into right relationship with his God. All of this is, is a beautiful picture of it, and for us, a picture of us symbolizing ourselves, consecrating ourselves to the Lord, pouring ourselves out. Paul wasn't holding anything back. He wasn't saying, I'm not going to go that far, God. I'm not going to do that for, for the people that I've been you know, telling about the Lord. No, he's saying with all joy, if it means my whole life for them to grow spiritually, Yes, and that's what the Lord did and does for us. And wow, yes. Uh, well, I was going to ask because I'm confused. Is it a special offering? Yes. I mean, we don't do blood anymore. Water, or it... it was one of the. They had all kinds of offerings that were given. It was a special offering that they could give. Was the drink offering? So okay. back in, in the time of the law when they were adhering to, we need to make these sacrifices, we make, need to make these offerings, they were given direction for making a drink offering to the Lord. But if I remember right, the drink offering was always, um, I'm sure I'm right, it was always by choice. It was never you have to. It was they could choose to. I'm sure I'm right on that. I need to go look that up, but I'm sure I'm right on it. But what a beautiful picture of Messiah pouring out his life for us. 
and us seeing an opportunity to do the same for him, to pour out our lives in service to him, that others might come to know the Lord. Beautiful, beautiful picture. We'll end on that note. Because I did lose some of my audience, we'll pick back up on that. We'll review that drink offering. Maybe by then I can have that, you know, but hearing it a second time may help you absorb it also. But I'll, I'll just say this place, this, um, is verse 15 part of it, or is that the next part? It is still. That Jacob named the place where God has spoken with him, Baal. Again, he, it's the place where God spoke. It's the place where God appeared. It's, it's, he set down a pillar there. You know, this is a stronghold for him. And wherever you have that in your life, have a place. Consecrate it to the Lord. Pour yourself out on the, the altar of sacrifice for the Lord. And see him. Show himself as El Shaddai as Almighty God, what He'll do in you and through you as you're poured out because you're that receptacle now that the Spirit can move through. Wow. Wow. You'll never be the same spiritually again. You'll see that the Lord is growing you to be more like Him. And It's the same way as when you cry out to God and you're praying out of love just to have that time with Him. It's pouring out in your heart Yes, for those who yeah. you love. Yes. Picture of it. Absolutely. Yes. Okay, so is this the same level for they're going to try to make this ladder up? It is the oh, same the place where God did the ladder. Yes. Yes. Same place. Yes. So, and again, that's a good way to look at it too. God revealed himself as the Messiah who would come down to this earth and bridge the gap from heaven to earth and here in the being poured out like a drink offering. And knowing that's Isaiah 53 and verse 12, we're seeing it again. You know, every bit of scripture, every bit of scripture, whether we can see it yet or not, as the Lord opens our spiritual eyes, all of it always speaks to Yeshua and his atoning work. Looking to it, looking back from it, but it's always a picture of it. Coming out of Egypt was a picture of it. As I looked at this psalm that the Lord showed me this new depth in, all of the heavens declaring the glory of God are declaring the sacrifice of Yeshua that's brought into those next verses that are showing us that it's not law that condemns, but it is through the, 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 the grace of God, through coming into his commandments, we come right with God through Yeshua, Jesus. And I could go on and on. That's why the road to Emmaus, the Lord took the scriptures, all that they you know, knew, and re showed them how they all revealed him. And their hearts burned. Wow. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Can you imagine when you get the teacher that are teaching it? You know, when Yeshua spoke in the temple at age 12 and confounded the wise men there by the students, the students of the scripture, he and, the, and then the scripture says a little bit later, he spoke as one who had authority. Why? Because he's the author. Get it? Authority, author, authority. You know, he had it. When, when you hear the one who, who wrote it, the one who created it, they own it. He owned it. And that's what's coming out. And oh, every bit of scripture is owned by him. Every bit of scripture speaks about him, whether we can see it or not. Ask God to open your eyes because I'm looking for it. I used to say it's in every book. Now I'm getting the point I want to say it's in every chapter. It's in every verse. We just don't know what we're going by yet. But there isn't anything that isn't exonerating him in some way, some form, some shape, all the way through. But what an exciting journey to go on and to soar to new heights and to see new sights, to explore new findings. I pray this will carry you for two weeks till we're back, <laughs> unless we get to go first. <laughs> so I've got to close it. Then those who want, I hope I've been on mic enough, all of a sudden I hear it yeah. better. But for those who need to go can, those who want to continue conversation, we can continue. But I've got to let the ones get out of my house who are trying to go. <laughs> so Lord, thank you. Thank you for being so awesome, amazing, ineffable, and indescribable. Lord, thank you for opening our eyes to see new depths and to learn new lessons and to soar to new heights and to go deeper with you. Lord, we're hungry for it, and we just ask you, let it be that spring of water that 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 springs up within us and drowns us, satiates us, 
and your glory. Thank you for this opportunity to drink at your well of salvation, to hear and to see, to touch and to feel, to know you are El Shaddai. You are Almighty God. You love us so. And you're our provider, our nourisher, our nurturer, our sustainer, and our strong God. Oh, there alone is enough to make the heart explode. Hallelujah. Praise you. Thank you forever and ever. Keep it coming, Lord. Keep it coming in your holy and precious name. I'd say I'm done, but I know my mouth won't shut, so <laughs> I won't even say it. But those who need to go, go. Rowena, go ahead. You get you get up first. 